so here we are again I'm in Barcelona at the moment heading back to the States tomorrow and um, happy that I can do this just got a little bit of time here and wanted to check in about some questions that were pressing on people's minds there were quite a few questions that came in and the ones that I picked out today have to do with uh, keeping your horse with you, teaching him to stay with you if you fall, and the other uh, important part of that is that if you fall and you are not um, free of him, if you catch your arm or your hand in the reins or the martingale or your foot in the stirrup, how do you ensure, how do you educate your horse that the best future for both of you is uh, connected to his decision to stay with you in that situation in that moment so this is a really important thing um, I have fortunately never been dragged I have some students and friends who have been and I've had friends that were stepped on and left and had to walk home and things like that so I want to try to get a very clear way of describing how to make sure this never happens to any of you you have to educate your horse to be with you and to be comfortable with you even in the worst of circumstances this lends itself well to uh, public situations and new environments where many people have experienced and reported to me that their horse is shy or become unmanageable it's kind of the same thing you want your presence to bring out the best in the horse and you want your presence to be a settling influence on your horse if he gets nervous and agitated or has a hard time being with you, then there are some things that need to change because he cannot change uh, the, his responses without your, uh, probably your better input. So I want to uh, now talk to you about the second question, which has to do with uh, keeping a horse um, able to go forward. In a, in a good cadence, your choice, of, uh, your choice of speed, your choice of upward and downward transitions and when, uh, on a lunge line of varying lengths, how to do that without running at your horse or crowding him, how to release him laterally, how to release his outside shoulder and hip uh, in a circle, in motion, not from a standstill necessarily, although you could, uh, and, and how to do this without running at him, confronting him, scaring him, chasing him, uh, raising your hand or a stick or a whip or a getting after him with your rope and things like that. All right, I don't know if I can do all this in an hour, but I'm going to try. Um, and so here we go. Uh, let's talk about how to keep the horse with you. If you're already riding your horse and you are trying to figure out how to get him to be with you now when you if you fall if he would and you know he would run home without you or if he would drag you if you were caught by a stirrup first thing I would say is you want to restart and rebuild part of the part of his foundation that was missed and that part has to do with your control of his feet and most importantly it's um, been my observation for a long time that uh, the horse is much more aware of what you're doing with your feet than most people are with what their horses are doing with their feet. And it doesn't take a horse long to realize that you are not thinking about his feet when you're focused on his head or his equipment, um, or if you're on the telephone or focusing on what other people are thinking about you while you ride or while you train. Or you are not really focused on where that horse's feet should go, in what sequence, at what speed, and when. It is very hard for him to continue to pay attention to what your feet, what your feet are doing. Um, <clears throat> so we'll start with that, and I and I want to say that uh, with all this, this is starting to be a pretty loud place. Uh, hoping that I can continue here in this cafe. Uh, we'll find out. Can you all hear okay, even with the background noise? I hope so. I realize there's um, it's a little bit of delay in your feedback to me, but if I need to find another place, I'd like you to tell me early instead of in 20 minutes, uh, unless it's a total chaos in here in 20 minutes. But um, anyhow, I'm gonna keep going. 
Okay, thank you. So, uh, you want to have in mind on the horse that already has trouble staying with you. Are you leaving uh, the final adjustment on your stirrups and are you leaving the uh, securing your right foot or your left foot in the uh, other stirrup until he's already walking off? Does he walk away as soon as you start to get on? If this sort of thing is happening, you can be sure that there's a, only a stride and a, and a nanosecond between uh, a walk stride, a standstill and a walk, and a standstill and a gallop. So you want to be sure to know that if you are allowing him and setting him up to think that walking off with you on him is a good idea, then he thinks it's a good idea. Because there's nothing you're doing to tell him otherwise, and in that case, you're training him ultimately to leave you when you fall. So let's make sure that we are balanced and that you are not uh, using uh, your full weight in the left or right stirrup when you get on. You're not using his wither uh, by holding the saddle horn to get on. You really have to start to think about the condition of his back long term. These are the types of things that have a horse uh, uncomfortable enough or imbalanced enough on short notice to have to reposition himself uh, in a bat to rebalance himself and often they will walk off if you don't um, let them know that rebalancing is fine but leaving is not. So these are things to start to think about early in your training please and also when you're leading your horse and you're teaching him on um, to follow you you can remember that following you and walking with you is part of him paying attention to the cadence of your own footfall. So when you're leading him, you can try to get your hips in time with the uh, rise and fall of his front feet. This will help him get used to understanding that you actually are in touch with him and in time with him as, as you think about where he's putting his feet, in what sequence, at what speed, and when. I can't emphasize this enough because whether you're in the cutting pen or you're training for the futurities, you are a candidate for top awards in dressage, eventing, or jumping all over the world, or whatever you're doing, even if you're just running a little backyard riding school. Uh, there is no one getting on any horse that can be sure that they're going to always be able to stay on. And so the conditions of your fall and the conditions, the mental condition of your horse when you fall is, should really be of utmost uh, importance and a real priority in your training. Um, it doesn't really matter how fancy the horse or how much he costs or whatever other circumstances are involved in your relationship. When you're on the way to the ground, you're on the way to the ground. So that's the point. And so from here we would take it that uh, you can begin to think about releasing him to a stop, whether you're on him or whether you are holding him or leading him, releasing a horse to a stop is a really important part of all this. And what that would mean is that you would not think in terms of grabbing his face or his head or his reins to get his feet stopped because that takes the focus off the job. The job is for him to stay with you. So the timing and placement of your feet has to be started in his mind by you paying close attention to the timing and placement of his feet and you matching that uh, when you go somewhere. The exercise I would suggest would be to uh, not take him away from other horses to start this, but to do it while you have other horses around or in sight or you're going a place that he would like to go, uh, where he can focus on your role in taking him there. Maybe you go a little bit more quickly, maybe you put a serpentine in here or you put a circle in either direction. Uh, but either way, it's important for you to decide what side of your body to have him on and not to put a hand in the other eye. So if you're on the right, you stay on the right. He's in your left hand and you don't put your hand under his face so that he can see your hand going boing out into his other eye, which will drive him back toward the direction and toward you direction you don't want him in and toward you. Ultimately, the horses that are unsure where to be and that have uh, a life or with a trainer or owner who changes hands on the lead rope behind their back, either anywhere from every day to many times a day to once in a while, this horse can never be sure quite when 
because this happens when he can't really see you. When you put your hands behind your back and shift the rope for your own convenience, it's usually unconscious, and this will put the horse in a state of sureness that he should have his nose right about between your shoulder blades. Now, this leads to lots of anticipation of being corrected because usually if you're used to being unclear about where you are, with whether you know it or not, you will change hands on the rope behind you all the time. This means that for him, you being in one eye or him following you as opposed to crowding you and then being abruptly corrected for having either run into you or crowded you and stepped on the back of your shoe or your heel or stepped all over your toe or pushed on you. This is the kind of thing that sets a horse up to hold his breath, tune you out, run into you and earn the label of what people commonly call disrespect. Um, it's not disrespect, it's training, and if you're the one involved in that training, it's a good time to take a close look at your contribution to his so-called behavior or attitude problem about people. Um, this is something that happens very, very uh, easily and often and unconsciously, that uh, it is so common, actually, that it's probably one of the most uh, frequent questions I get, my horse is pushy, what do I do? Well, you have to not teach him to crowd you, and part of that, of course, goes back to some of the earlier discussions we had about hand feeding and rewarding him for coming in close, just to be set up by the same hand, to be smacked in the nose, bumped under the chin, pushed at the shoulder, pushed in the shoulder groove, where you want to have him actually free and available to receive a rein when you ride him, or um, driving lines or whatever it is that you're going to do with them. It could be in the next 10 minutes, the next days, weeks, or in years. But either way, it's really nice if the shoulder groove is um, kind of a blank slate, a little bit virgin territory for new information, and your reins are going to be largely ignored if you are using uh, his shoulder and his neck as uh, and face and head as a focus of correction for the crowding that you set him up to think is quite okay. And as I said before, this is something that is usually inadvertent, unplanned, not conscious. When we lead them, as instructed many times, right under the chin, take two reins in one hand and bend that bit in half and jam it up in the palate and wonder why he doesn't like following or being held that way. Shake his head, move you out of the way with his shoulder. It is really hard for them to forfeit um, their dignity. And when you crowd them and take 50% of their vision with the side of your face or your cowboy hat or your shoulder if you're a larger person, and then also you have them right up here throttled underneath the chin with a halter or banging around with a snap or held roughly underneath the mouth when they're uh, bridled up, when they've got a drop nose band that ties the bit tight and two ha uh, one hand holding two reins firmly to keep him with you and then disciplining him by a number of ways that people do um, when he steps on the back of your foot or shoves you out of the way because he is too close to give you the space that you truly need and deserve. So these are this is the culpability that we have unconsciously and this goes right into having a horse prefer to maybe offer you a little more space. Uh, whenever he gets the chance, which would start to explain why horses don't hang out when you fall off, because being away from uh, a lot of mixed messages and conflicting input about how close should I be, uh, are you going to love me in this moment, am I supposed to line up for a Facebook shot, a kiss on the nose, a little carrot, a little doot 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 doot, that's what they do, and I did it too. I was raised to give a carrot with a flat hand, hold my thumb in as instructed. Don't put your fingers up, don't let him bite you if he does give him a smack. This is not really so nice, is it? Not if you're the horse. The carrot's nice. And really, the thing to remember is the horses do know if you love them, they do know if you care, and what they do, the same way people do around, and they know that they are cared for and well regarded but you are constantly irritated by somebody who you know loves you and who you also care for you learn not to engage too much you kind of disengage as you share space you don't listen or you don't think or you just tune out and this is something that is um, a choice it's a choice to 
prepare your family and friends to feel that way about you and it's a choice to continue to participate with people who do that. Meaning that when you create the need for people to tune out, do you really want to be that way and how does it feel to be sharing space with someone who would prefer that you either aren't talking or aren't there, whether they love you or not. And let's presume that they do. This is something that really has to do with lifestyle choice and how you're going to communicate. And it takes a lot of conscious thought and effort to be clear. It's really easy to not be clear. And it's one of my goals in life to give myself the best possible access to the best in my friends and the best in my students and the best in my family by not being a pain in the ass. And I don't like to be that way toward a dog or toward a horse or toward people I care about. Sometimes you can't help it. And we all know this about life. So there's part of all this in it, which is how are we as people. Now, as far as the horse that is gonna leave you, we're gonna go next to an exercise that we've talked now about. How do you socialize? Where do you stand? How do you walk with the horse in a normal way to think, or is he following you? Are you at his eye? Are you at his shoulder? Are you driving him? Are you back by the stirrup? There's no reason that you can't travel along with a horse in any of these positions as long as you're paying attention to the placement and timing of his feet and the other things around both of you that might um, get his attention when you least expect it and take the control of the bridge of his nose away from you. Why is that important? Because once the bridge of the nose, and by the bridge of the nose, I mean this right here, okay, on him. You have his eyes out here, you have his little ears up here, and the bridge of his nose is this. Once he takes that a, 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 a few degrees to the left of right or center and becomes either alarmed or needs to leave or scared or self-preservation instinct takes over and he's on his way out, you are not gonna control the timing and placement of his feet for one more instant because very much like a boat or a canoe when you take the front one way the hips go the other so if he you're on his right which I would like you to be more often if you're only a, a right-handed person who has lived on the left side of your horse start getting him balanced on the ground and if he tips his nose away from you which he is not likely to do much more likely that a horse will try to duck his head and shoulder to the right because they've been, uh, many of them set up on the left side from young age. So they're gonna be much more inclined to bail out, leave the scene to the right. But either way, what happens is that the hips will come toward you. So if you're behind the jaw or between the face and the shoulder or you're at the shoulder or you're at the stirrup, you're gonna get either knocked over, kicked on the way by, and there's a really important thing to mention. Please let go. <laughs> Please let go. Uh, the rope burns on the hand really feel bad. And it also doesn't do the horse any good to find out how strong you're not. When he's on his way, he's on his way. It's much better to just open your hand, let the rope go. And, uh, you know, we're going to hope that you have done your work about uh, teaching him how to uh, respect and understand uh, a rope of any length that is on the ground when he's standing or running and you there are, we can talk about how to do that in another in another session not right now we've got 15 minutes more to explain before I change the topic on how you get these horses set up to stay with you so I'll review a little bit now you want to get in time with the feet you want to have it very clear that whatever side you're on, he understands that you control the bridge of his nose on that side, which means you control the placement and timing of his hips. That would be whether you're falling off and jerking his head to the ground because you got your shoulder or your armpit caught in a rein, which has happened to me, or your foot caught in a stirrup, which has happened to me. The worst fall I ever had, I believe I talked about it in some depth, where I came off the right side of the horse with my left foot stuck in the stirrup, hanging down there on the right side with my head banging into his back leg and my arm stuck in the rein and I was looking at his face over his own back. So that was a really ugly one and I fortunately had done my work. So I did not end up having to be a statistic that day. I was in the statistics of people who 
made it. So to make it means you learn how to fall, that's one thing. You ride with breakaway stirrups, that's the second thing. You're gonna protect your head, please. One head, one life. I will just remind some of you who may not have heard this, I've got an uncle still in full-time round the clock care, 365 days a year from a brain injury and no helmet. So right up front, close and personal in my life and really, really an unappealing reality. So I'll just warn you, handsome people who don't like the way your hair or face or look or the way you feel or the way the mirror reflects you in your helmet, too bad, wear it, please. Because why on earth would anybody put time into teaching you how to train a horse and ride if you're just gonna trash yourself on a first fall? I wouldn't, and I don't teach people who don't wear helmets, mainly for that reason. I don't want responsibility for the fall, and I also don't want to invest in people that don't care about themselves enough to protect their heads. It's just, it's a real no-brainer. You wear a seatbelt, protect your head, at least, you want to think about the people who you would leave behind having to take care of you. So that point is made, and we'll go now to the importance of establishing a reliable backup in your horse because the stop and his ability to stay stopped cannot be any better, really, than his understanding of how to stay stopped, okay? Easiest way for a horse to stay stopped is on two diagonals. That would mean that you would work in your foundation to establish hips that are aligned, forehand that's not too heavy, all four feet that are available for the asking. That would start with the way you clean the feet, ask for the feet, the way you medicate, who knows, thrush, uh, 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 an abscess, some sort of tendon or fetlock injury if you have that unfortunate development. Anytime you're handling a foot, it should be really, really clear to the horse that his weight has to immediately go on the other three feet. So when you ask, not when you pull, when you ask, that hoof should come up in your hand. All of this business about staying with you has to do with, is he with you at all when you ask for a foot? Does it take five, six, seven, eight kilos to pick up that foot, 10 pounds to push into him with your shoulder and drag that foot off the ground? If that's what you've got going, you're not in control of the feet, he is. Just because you can grunt and sweat and pull and push and force him to accommodate you does not mean he's with you. It means he's putting up with you. There's a real big difference. And that's why I mentioned this thing about people and friends and family who tolerate you and whom you tolerate versus enjoy. Okay, a real engagement is a joyful thing. Even in the down times, you're engaged, you're discussing, it's real. You're engaged in discussing and it's real. And that's why disengaging the hindquarters as a long-term uh, goal and practice before you ride every time, every time, unless you're going to square up that horse at the end of that exercise and put his weight back on the hips, take it off the forehand, I would suggest that you don't invest in that exercise because I don't see horses that are squared up after that exercise. They are left with one hip or the other one back and over time this uh, actually weakens and and reshapes the whole back end of a horse on an imbalanced sacrum pelvis alignment and what you end up is a horse with often is a horse that's just on sort of a triangle. He will walk that way, he will stand that way, and he will carry that uh, form into a form into a function that follows the form into difficulty with standing still when you get on. Usually lead changes from left to right are more difficult with horses that are constantly stepped over behind and only are stopped with one rein. These are things that I want you to think about in terms of being able to have a horse fill in for you with a balanced stop, a, excuse me, a balanced stop and the ability to stay with you um, while you sort out your predicament. And you know, if you're lucky enough to jump to your feet and walk home or try to find him, that's great. If you're standing there with a fracture or a sprained leg or You've got the bridle in your hand and he's off running toward town and you know, you've smacked your head. 
or broken some ribs. I mean, this is this stuff happens. This happens. And these are things that if you've got a horse that can stand with you, you've got a cell phone on the fender of your stirrup, you got a horse that is partner enough because you've been alert and attentive and detailed enough to include these things and these possibilities in your foundation, you will be really, really well set up. Um, I'll just say that before I, I'll just add to this, I've got about 10 minutes more to talk to you about some things. Um, I would spend a lot of time on the ground either sitting or kneeling and brushing their legs while you squat down there so that the first time they see you down there is not when you come over that shoulder at 50 miles an hour off a gallop, bam. And then maybe he, having not seen that, doesn't understand what to do with the sudden arrival of you at his feet. A lot of people will survive a fall and get stomped right in the head or other places. You, you just, I, I would rather that you have set your horse and yourself up to succeed than get outfitted with, you know, something that looks like body armor from head to foot, which I've seen, um, you know, with the idea that you're going to plan to have the horse stomp on you in a surprise move after you land, you know, survive the fall and land and then you have to deal with that. It's absolutely unnecessary. So one of these things you can do is you can sit on a bucket and you can learn to, you can teach your horse to back an arc away from you. You can lunge him in a circle around you. You can do a lot of things down low with your face about at knee level. You can teach him to come up and bring you a stirrup when you're, I don't know about seated, I like to keep my toes on the ground so that I can stand up if I have to. I generally won't sit down or lie down anywhere near a horse on the ground that's standing up because it's not the safest place to be. But as far as preparing him to understand what it's like to have someone stand up from a squatting position when you're sitting down on your heels, these are really important things to get built into your colts. Um, the other thing is that you want to have him understand that you can reach up for a stirrup from the ground without him wondering. Uh, if you're lying down there and he's got, as I've had happen, this happened to me in, uh, I think it was Texas. It was it Texas? Minnesota. It was Minnesota. 2002 in Minnesota. I got bucked off in a round pen on my good horse. I had never ridden her in a round pen. I galloped her out everywhere, all over the desert, all over the ranches, everywhere I took her. I thought I was going to lope her in a round pen. I realized I'd never loped her in that small a circle. And uh, as soon as I livened her up, she went straight up in the air. And when I came down, she took the earring out of my ear with her hoof and she landed on my braid with the other one. Okay, so that's two feet on either side of my head right here, okay? And that was in front of the 4-H club. Emily, you may remember that. Not my proudest moment. Um, and also, that day I did not have a helmet on. So I bowed to all those kids. I was very embarrassed. I was very lucky to didn't get a hoof in the nose, but I also vowed that I would not ride without a helmet again and I don't think I don't think I have actually since then so uh, and I didn't that was not a habit of mine to ride without a helmet either in those days but I did that day and I got very very lucky so I had also laid into that mare the ability to stand still she was four and a half she was four and a half at the time so she landed on that ear and on my hair I picked her foot up off my ear, rolled out of the way, and what can I say? I live to tell about it, but this is really important. So how do you get it so that they can land on you and they can know to take a foot up where you want it to be? Well, you practice picking up each foot. On all my horses, I can pick up a diagonal. How, do, how and why do I do that? Well, I do that because that's the way they used to be shot in the, in the wars f for all time. Horses are shot at night. Often, they're shot at night or they're shot in the day and they're working at night, whichever way it is. But you usually, in military operations in former times, you had one guy on a back foot, one guy on a front foot. It was a very quick operation. They could reshoe a horse inside of about 10 or 11 minutes. 
pick up a diagonal and get to work. So because we know a horse can balance on two legs and that they do at the trot, they also do in the backup. This is why you want to get this backing so clear. When I'm talking about backing, I am not talking about pushing them back now. I'm talking about following them back. A horse that is pushed back never really understands what backing is because you're never out of his way. It's just another experience of uh, a certain kind of indignity or a certain type of submission that has no actual connection to the skills you'll need him to employ when you're down there on the ground unable to help yourself. Okay, so these are things that I will, uh, if there are further questions about this, I think if you lay these different pieces into your foundation or you rebuild your foundation around these things that I've mentioned here and you also make sure that you uh, don't over tighten a cinch. I really want to say you need to tighten your cinch but uh, I've run into an awful lot of people that over tighten. This makes horses actually buck more than they should, makes them tighter than they should be and once they get you off they can't help but run. They can't help it because a flopping stirrup on a too tight saddle is an impulsion producing uh, experience and they really have to move out. So make sure if you're not clear about how to tighten a saddle that you get clear about it and that you have saddles that fit and I will encourage you to be fit and if you need to lose weight please do. Why wait to lose weight? Why wait to get in shape? It feels good when you're in shape and if you have trouble and you don't know what to do you can call me or write to me and I can help you because I have put together diets for lots of people. Uh, you want to try to tie it to your blood type and tie it to your activity level and to your environment and to what's available. And um, I mean, I'm not, okay, I'm not a healthcare consultant, by no means am I, but I do have from time to time and a little more often than I wish, students that need to lose weight and I've helped them do it. So. I can help you by sending you to the right sources of information that I hope will inspire you to get right with it because it's just not fun to fall off and it's a lot more fun if you do fall off to be able to get up and feel great and not have to go find your horse but continue your ride. Okay, so it is 8.15. Um, there are two more points on this which are important enough to, for me to mention is that if you have not clearly understood how to uh, get your horse to bring his head down to you. Uh, this is something, all of these things that I'm talking about, the component pieces of a horse that will stay and stand with you and back up properly and be led properly. Chapter four in Bill's book is a great way to review this. Uh, there are things that I would update if I were to rewrite that book today. Uh, there are things that I would make a little bit uh, easier to understand. There are probably some different photos that I would put in. Um, still a very adequate manual and many people that I know have trained horses start from right in the beginning being green riders. Um, someone in my own family actually trained a horse right out of that book and got to the point where they were showing their six-year-old Morgan after three or four years of studying the book and trying the things that Bill left with us to think about and to, and to practice with our horses. So the longitudinal flexion, which means over the top from the tail to the nose, and lateral flexion, which means side to side, um, all of these things are going to be extremely important in an urgent situation uh, so that you have 100% control of the pole, which will give you 100% control of the timing and placement and stillness or movability, maneuverability of the feet and the horse's body, okay? I probably left out tons of stuff, but I think if you can uh, begin to organize around that, you will be seeing uh, progress and experiencing a lot of good results. The hardest thing in the world is to uh, view yourself as your horse does, so try consciously to think about your behavior and your choices from his point of view. Film yourself uh, frequently. I really mean it. Film yourself working with a horse frequently so that you can see the things that you do inadvertently, unconsciously, that cause the horse to be confused or to fail and then be, I don't know about entitled to, but certainly receiving a correction that you might want to think about not doing.
Okay, so set them up to succeed, and uh, we set them up to succeed, and then we have less to complain about and less to worry about. Okay, now, all right, I've got about 24 minutes to talk to you about lunging and increasing the size of your circle and the quality of your circle and the diameter of your circle without charging in on your horse. Okay, this has to do with your own relationship to line of sight, core energy, and I'm gonna encourage you to, uh, you're welcome to draw a picture of two feet, your own two feet, your horse's four feet, little, just make little footprints on a circle and your lunge line in between. Take a look at where it is that you look, where you stand, and how you manage that lead rope or that lunge line, and where it is on the horse's body that you're focusing, and then you will start to understand a little more clearly why he either does or does not do what you want, okay? Um, the most common lunging phenomenon, which is a dysfunctional aspect of this important tool, which you certainly don't need to lunge a horse, but many people do. You don't need to use a round pen, many people do. You can use a square pen or you can do none of it. You're still gonna get a well-broke horse if you understand what he needs you to know, which is where do you want his feet? So there's one thing about where you want his feet that is a little bit tricky. It's not only on a tight circle or a big circle or a fast circle where you want his feet, it's what shape do you want his body to be in on those feet? The most common thing is to have a horse that is counterbent, looking outside the circle, pulling on your lead rope, uh, and straightening out as he hauls around a circle, the faster he goes, the harder he pulls. And this is something that will absolutely uh, have a, an impact and not a great one on how he chooses to stop. Because as you're lunging your horse, it needs to be very clear before you start whether you want to stop him on a circle so that you can approach him at the stirrup or the head or the butt or any of his legs, or whether you're going to just haul on his head spin his butt out to the side and dump him on the forehand. Whatever you're doing in that lunging procedure is gonna be the setup for the horse you ride. Just remember that. That's the bad news. Good news is you can set it up however you want if you understand what the function of a circle is in a horse's life. And if you're using a circle in the best possible way, you're gonna use it to establish straightness. What do I mean by straightness in a circle? If you're a bird up in the sky looking down on, let's say, the Amtrak route from Seattle to San Francisco, you're going to see a lot of these little uh, mountain passes and serpentines and little squiggle lines that, is for, that are formed by uh, railroad tracks that were set in originally for mining and, and uh, transportation of goods, now used as passion, passenger rails uh, also. But it's important to remember that as you look at a train, it looks like a little string or a little piece of rope going through the mountains. Every piece of steel that is in that track and every piece of, every car in a long line of trains that looks like a little rope or a snake going through the mountains, those cars are straight. And you can have your horse straight also if he is well aligned and well positioned in an arc. What I mean by straightness in an arc, it means really an inner balance in which the straightness that is, how do I say this? Well, his back is made up of vertebrae. His vertebrae don't bend. They move around each other just like the cars in a train do. Okay, so you've got lots of little straight pieces in this horse. What starts to make it difficult to keep a horse round on a circle and straight in his travel is when you lower a hip, you have unbalanced feet, you have too much head, uh, too much force on his head, too much power going into his butt, and into his back end to make him go. So he's dropping a shoulder in his rib cage toward you. He's ready to kick at you as you go by, as he goes by. This is if he's loose or on a lunge line. These are things that really need to be taken into consideration because what, what goes hand in hand with horses that are running like this in a circle is the inability 
to put the eye they are used to seeing you in, in a soft and considered way toward the hip that is on the inside of that circle, which will bring him into round. Because the avoidance of the pressure in the traditional lunging scenarios is what causes them to counterbend uh, and really in the end, resist your reign and resist all your aids. Okay, it's really important to get clear that straight is something, it's a phenomenon that should weigh nothing in your hand at any speed. You can have collection, you can have contact, there's nothing wrong with that, but as far as uh, a horse running off with you, a horse going hell-bent forward straight, and you're just hanging on those face, the, the face with your feet on the dashboard and your butt slamming up and down on his back, um, you know, those should not be really proud moments, I wouldn't think. And often what goes along with relationships like that, unless you get to see yourself and see other examples of how to do it differently and see yourself as you really are up there and get, you know, have to ultimately pay if you are the kind of person who would do that for the repair on your horse's body that long-term exposure to riding and handling like this creates the need for. Um, horses don't hold up well for long when they're counterbent, run hard, put up wet, and have no maintenance. Add that to being stalled, add that to many other things, too much sugar in the feed, imbalanced feet, and too much confinement, and you're going to have a horse with a really uh, compromised experience and the attitude that goes with that. So when we talk about horses and our way of handling them, do we want them to trust us, do we want them to respect us, I would say that the respect has to come first. And what do I mean by that? And what does this have to do with how we lunge them? When the respect comes first, that's where your safety comes in, okay? You think about the people that you trust in your own life and the people that you respect. The, the, the most rewarding relationships that I have are the people that I trust and respect. There are other groups of people acquaintances and friends that I have on a scale, maybe a little more trust than respect for, maybe a little more respect for than trust. This comes from experience. And the longer you get to know someone, hopefully the more those things can balance out so that trust and respect are kind of an equal thing and you go forward with relationships that really feel good and you want the same with your horse. But the problem with horses that trust you and don't respect you is that what they trust is that you'll get out of the way and that's not nice because when you fall off maybe you can't get out of the way and if you are producing a reaction in them that is disturbing to them you know basically running a flight animal in a small pen up against a wall with or without the rope basically you're chasing a flight animal how in the world is he supposed to know to stay with you when you're hanging by a foot? You're chasing him then. Just ask him. Ask him. Think about it. You're riding along, you're chasing him with your heels. You're riding along, you fall off, you're dragging by one foot, you're chasing him at his heels now, dragging along beside him. Why wouldn't he kick you loose? Why wouldn't he keep kicking you if, you, if your foot was still in the stirrup? Some of them will. So this is the kind of thing that we want to remember that any time you're working a horse in a circle to the left, you are using that leading rein, and you're either teaching him to stay with you and put the float toward you, float by that, I mean slack, a soft, a belly in the rope, take the tension out of that rope as it is between that halter or that lunging cabison in your hand. Why not have him bring you the slack? If you don't want to be tearing his mouth off when you turn left or right, don't teach him that that's the rule when you're lunging him, you see? Your leading rein is the rein that comes to your hand in the eye that he can see you. Then you get on him, you have two leading reins, okay? Each hand is a leading rein, each hand is also a support rein. When you tip that nose to one degree to the left of right or center, left, when you tip his nose to the left or right of center, your hands change functions, okay? What was your leading rein becomes your support rein. What was your support rein becomes your leading rein. As you change direction, 
your feet need to change jobs, your arms need to change jobs, and your hands need to change jobs. Okay? What do I mean by that? The support rein, frequently misused, does not mean that you bring both hands onto one side of the neck. If you're bringing both hands onto one side of the neck in a turn, your tightest rein becomes your outside rein, and it tips the pole the other way. And all of it, all it really does is it mimics the affront, it mimics the assault on his balance and his senses that you would display lunging him the same way, which is counterbent. So what I do, I set up a line of sight when I'm riding. I look where I want to go. As I look where I want to go, my shoulder opens in that direction. I make sure that my foot is not on a sloppy, loose, out of control stirrup so that my foot jumps up there and blocks the leading shoulder. I make sure to keep my heel under my hip just as I do when I'm standing up. If you don't have your heel under your hip when you're standing up, where do you go? Forward, backwards, or sideways, but you don't stay standing up, okay? So this is the thing that I want to try to get clear that your, your proper lunging and your ability to release him away from you on a circle versus charge into him put him on the defense, run him toward a fence, run him toward a wall, run him into a corner. And it's really important to look at this stuff from his point of view now. Okay, really important. I'd like you to share this information with your friends if you think it's interesting or important. Also, I wanted to say before I go, I wanted to talk a little bit about the clinics that are upcoming in Sweden. So if you have friends in Sweden, around the Stockholm area or in central Sweden, or people in Scandinavia that would like to come, we are going to be doing all these things. Setting the horse up to stop when you fall off, learning how to lunge horses and release them to a variety of different assignments and maneuvers on a lead rope, on a lunge line in which you can separate the function of the hips and the shoulders. It's no different and no more complicated than understanding that you have a leading hand, you have a supporting hand. You have the, the horse has the same setup, he just has two more feet than we do. But he's gonna use his hands, he's gonna use his hips in very similar ways that we do. The main difference in our anatomy and the horses is that we have these collarbones right here and they do not have collarbones connecting their shoulders to their spine. They have, uh, they have soft tissue, there are tenons, and uh, muscles and ligaments throughout the whole forehand of the horse that hold him together. And the more we can be respectful of his, uh, the fragile aspect of his mind and his anatomy, the more responses we can be sure of and know that when we have the bottom half of ourself on the top half of that horse, that we have uh, not just a good friend under there who trusts us, but one that respects his job. Okay, now teaching the horse to respect his job means that you set him up to succeed, not to be corrected, okay? Remember that as his owner, as his friend, as his trainer, as his groom, if you're correcting him, he's not clear what you want. And if you are not able to show him what you want without correcting him for what you don't want, then your focus really is not on what you want. Your focus is in looking for the things that he's doing wrong. That will start to occupy too much time, too much focus for both of you, so that the training becomes looking for what's wrong instead of establishing how to build in these responses that are truly on the ground going to build a better ride, okay? So, <clears throat> if you can get some practice coiling your rope and you have a long enough rope of the right material, you'll be able to establish for him when you will release uh, two or three feet of rope, but that's the rope he should use to widen the circle, okay? And depending on uh, whether your relationship with him is one of pressure and release or feel and release, and whether you're in the middle of uh, learning how to release him through feel or learning how to be a little bit gentler in your pressuring him, um, he will begin to respond by using the rope that you drop to him on a circle. So if you're in the center and you want him to widen that circle, you release that rope to him, and I don't mean drop four coils of rope on the floor. I'm talking about you give him enough information about the way you are moving, the amount of energy you're about to release in yourself, not toward his body, 
But what I do is I, I treat myself like a slingshot, okay? I was really good at slingshots when I was a kid. We used to use those a lot in school, okay? You want to hit somebody with a pee or a spitball, you just pull that rubber band back and bam, okay? So what I do, I don't have any slingshot with me uh, when I'm lunging, but I become a slingshot. I become the string on that bow. I take from my, I was trying to show a friend of mine this the other day, I pull from right here to my hip bones. Okay, so from my shoulders to my hip bones, I put this shape in my body, boing, like that. I pull back, but I don't crouch down. I don't crouch down, I don't speed up. I take my shoulders back over my hips, and I just look behind that horse about two or three meters, I drop that line, and that horse just explodes forward. Don't believe me? Ask somebody who's seen me do it. I don't know how else to say it. It works. You can tip, you can take that forehand right up like this. Here's your horse. Here's your horse. You can take that forehand. Let's see, you're walking along like this. You take the forehand up, just like that. Bam. Now, that is true. I'm going to have to make a movie of this. Doesn't sound believable, does it? Just, I mean, it's just so clear to me how to do it, and I've taught people how to do it. It's so frustrating not to be able to make these videos the way I want. Anyhow, I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep picking away at it, and maybe what I'll do, I think I'll do this tonight. I will draw, I will draw and scan, I'll draw and photograph the pictures of how to do this. I think that's the best I can do for right now. And then, as soon as I can, uh, maybe even this weekend up in New Hampshire, maybe I'll film that. I'm going to fly home tomorrow, and I've got to get right on the road and go to New Hampshire. So I guess I'll just have to find some horses that, and some friends to do this with, and we'll just try to get a little clip of it and put it up here. How's that? That's, I think, what I should do. Uh, anyway, you're going to need some practice coiling your rope. You want to make sure that you know as a skill and as a habit, habits are very important. You want to be able to get the right habit so that when you drop a coil of rope, you're dropping it toward the horse, not between your two hands so that you get to trip over that one. Um, I actually rarely keep a rope in two hands when I'm lunging. I like to be able to get that horse out away from me and walk him on 25 feet. How many of you walk your horse? At a, at a nice, lively walk with him around on the circle. Trot okay, lope okay. How many of you walk your horse on a 20-foot line? Two speeds of walk, two speeds of trot, without pulling, without throwing him on the forehand, without him facing up. This is really important, really important to discipline yourself, to learn how to do this, okay? I want you to do it. I think I better go. There's more I could do, but I'm going to draw these photographs. Um, I've got to get plenty of sleep, get early to the airport, so I will see you later. Okay? Please share this with your friends if it's useful. Please have a look at the um, clinic listings and consider coming to watch or to participate uh, in Knutby at Captain Stalet. And Anna Norlin is in charge of that one. That is on the 10th to the 12th of August. I hope you will help me promote that because my website and my promotion skills are not very good and I'm in the process of updating lots of things but I could really, really use the help getting word out about these two clinics. I haven't been in Sweden to, to put on something in a number of years, about five years, and I would love to have this be a success for everyone involved. Uh, the following weekend, the 16th through the 19th, I'm going to be in uh, Calva Falls and Osa and Ale Forsell, Osa Strandberg and Ale Forsell, uh, I'm sorry, Ule Forsell, mispronunciation there, sorry Ule. Uh, they, uh, they have a, just an absolutely outstanding facility and we're going to have a wonderful time. Antonio Hidalgo is going to be working on both of those events with me. We are going to be doing some uh, work with uh, local people or people who are traveling in from far away also I know of 
other countries and other dis long distances in Sweden. Um, and we're going to be talking about how to get your horses ready to jump, and if they're already jumping, how to jump better, okay? Uh, body alignment and equitation is part of this. Preparation for horses that are worried about fences. Uh, Reschooling horses that are sour or have been jumped too much and have some habits that you'd rather that they didn't have, like going too fast or not stopping after the fence or ducking out, not changing leads properly, not being able to slow down for a combination or a corner. We're going to be working on all kinds of things like this that will, even for Western riders and people with other disciplines and goals, be very helpful. Okay, so don't let the jumping tag and uh, don't let the jumping tag uh, deter you. You can come with a Western saddle, we'll still have fun and you'll learn loads. All right, talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.